Hey, it's Dorinda Medley, and today I am on Hollywood Raw promoting my book, Make It Nice, sold where everywhere books are sold, and I am ready to tell you all about Dorinda Medley in all ways and every way. Hope you're going to love it, and you're going to learn more about me and laugh. Yo, what's up, Hollywood Raw family? How are you guys doing? Like, subscribe, follow our YouTube channel. I'll follow you back if you do it. Uh, comment down below. <laughs> It's a big one. So our guest today is an energetic, fun, and fan favorite reality star from the Real Housewives of New York franchise, and now is an author of the book "Make It Nice." Dorinda Medley, welcome. So I want to get into it first. Dorinda, thank you for coming on the Hollywood Raw podcast. I, I first want to get into something very, very important with you. Something that's very uh, newsworthy um, that we've been seeing in the tabloids right now. I want to ask you about Hellman's Mayo. Um, you are a big fan. I don't know why you got into mayo. Do you know Hamas mayo is my favorite thing ever? Is, is it really? Is you know mayonnaise really? One thing that I, you, I swear to God, this is true. It's so funny you say this. There, when what would we play? If there's one thing you could bring on a deserted island, what would it be? Hellman's mayo. Mayo. I could eat it with. I can't think of a thing that Hellman's mayo isn't good on. I actually can't. <laughs> you know what I love, Adam? Before you joined us, I was sitting here talking to Rinda. Did you know, dude, she's like actually packing the boxes with her books to send out to people. Like she is putting the personalized touch on all these books that she's sending to her friends and family. Yes. I love that, Dorinda. There's well, not a lot of people that I would do that. Because you know what? You go through, I, I was showing them the box I did. I did this whole gift box, right? Which I worked very hard on. I had a thing and then I did you know, the inside. And I thought, you know what? I have to put a personalized note because you go through all that effort and then they're going to open it up. But if you see a personalized note, it's like hosting and doing anything. If you personalize it, people feel obligated to fall in love with it. So how many, how many boxes are you personally packing right now with a letter? Like how much time are you putting into uh, this like, big book you know, release? We have 155. Okay. And, and they're going out to all your friends, all the My people friends you know? friends and, and influencers and people that have supported me and people that... You know, I'm very lucky because when I first started The Housewives, I had a bunch of, what people don't realize about this, I remember Reza said something to me at the Upfronts when we used to go to Upfronts. He said, now you're part of the Bravo family. Now what's weird to the rest of the world is normal to us. And I didn't <laughs> get it, right? But there is sort of this thing where the, the Bravo people all come around you. And people don't realize it, well, at least from my experience, I have a lot of great friends from all the franchises that are always very supportive. And I think that's what's so sad about BravoCon not being on this year because you go and it's like you see your extended, I mean, call it Bravo family, call it mafia, I don't know, but it, it definitely is something, we we have a little inner sanctum secret that none of the rest of the world, because we get it, yeah. you know what I mean? So a lot of, I'm sending you know, to all my Bravo family. Here, I got a question. Does Oprah get a little gift book? Listen, I'm going to try, okay? I'm going to try. I don't know if it'll get to her, but I'm going to try. The note, I'm going to try. I got to think really hard about what I write on that one. Dorinda, I'm, I don't want to say anything, but Adam knows Oprah pretty well. I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, oh. Oprah's a friend, you know? But, uh, <laughs> well, you give, me so your, give me your direct address then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what's so interesting? So the, the new book, Make It Nice, uh, congratulations on that again. It's uh, It's pretty exciting. I feel like the title of book is like so important, so like so crazy. Like you probably have all these title ideas to go in your head and you want to make it something good. You want to make it something that stands out because it's something that's going to be a part of you for the rest of your life. How how difficult was it to kind of name your book, uh, Make It Nice? I don't think – listen, that's it. That's a stamp in my life. I can't go anywhere in the world now without somebody yelling out, Make It Nice. I do not go through a day – without someone yelling. I was I was in London before the pandemic. I was on my way to South Africa. And I was like, oh my God, I was checking into the Barclay. I thought, because I lived in London for so many years, I thought, well, I'm back here. I'm not that person. I'm now this person. And literally, I, I, I kid you not, someone drove by the Barclay and said, make it nice. I thought, <laughs> this is it. I told my daughter that on my epitaph, I want them to put, she made it nice. I'll the seven. <laughs> So you I mean, might just that, I, follow I, me right through because make it nice is not a statement. It's a sentiment really. Mm -hmm. And it was a sentiment when I said it 
And it's just a sentiment, I think, about how you host and run your life and treat your friendships and how you go about the way you do things. And we've all been there where we just try to make it nice, make it nice. And then you have that frustrating moment like I did on TV where like, I made it nice! You know, you <laughs> just have to, it's that thankless moment. So I think of it more as a sentiment more than I think of it as a title, you know? And people get it. They relate it to me. It's stuck now. That and that well bitch will follow me forever. <laughs> I think if I was going to have a We're book I, and people are going to be yelling stuff out at me, I'd be like, I'd name a book like Great Ass or something. So people are like, hey, Great Ass. And then I feel really good everywhere I'm walking around. With all the things I did in the world, with all the places I lived and people I meet, meet have met, the two, maybe even three, it's make it nice, not well, bitch, and clip. I, I can't get away from it. I just so can't. What what made you want to do a book in general? I mean, that that's kind of a big undertaking and, you know, well, it's it was all revealing. About, you know, listen. For me, it was definitely an undertaking. I always say that Richard, when Richard, Richard was a huge writer, my late husband, like just wrote all the time and a pro prolific writer. So is my daughter. She's an academic and she loves to write. I don't know if anyone loves to write, but she engages in it, you know, very ferociously. And I said to Richard once, I'll never forget it, we we're coming back from a cocktail party and I was had I didn't want to go at first and it was all these sort of council of foreign relations pe people and I had just killed it. Like one and I remember saying to Richard, I am so interesting. Like look at your wife. I could talk about anything and I could I don't know what half of what these people were talking about tonight at the council, but I somehow engaged them because that's who I am. I said, you know what? I'm so interesting, Richard, that I think I too am gonna be a writer. He literally guffawed. He didn't just laugh. He laughed at me. He said, Dorinda, you like people too much. You like to, t I would listen to you talk about laundry, but you don't know how to keep quiet enough to write a book because you do, you have to be very in silence to write a book. No one's there to respond to it. So you write something and there's no response. I like immediate response, a laugh, mm -hmm. a, a comment, an interaction. And, um, so it was really, it was an undertaking, but I had the time. I just was put on pause. It was the pandemic and I was back at Bluestone Manor and there was really no, there weren't a lot of distractions, right? So I was here and I really treated it like a job. And I thought Simon and Schuster came to me and said, do you want to write a, you know, want to write a book? And they'd actually come to me before I even was put on pause. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it if I'm filming. I don't know how I'm going to do it if I'm engaged in life. you got to sit still. I don't sit still. You know, that's not sort of my thing. Um, but all of a sudden I was back at Blue Star Manor, you know, two miles, three miles away from where I grew up and going through my baby albums and my yearbooks and my weddings and my being with my parents and eating the food that I ate when I was 12 again. You know what I mean? And it just kind of was a full circle moment. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. And Hannah was a huge help to me because she was home. And it just, it was very kismic. It just all worked out. It seemed correct. The timing seemed correct. Yeah. And also too, you know, when you're on a show and it's very hard for people think they know you, but they can only show parts of you. And obviously there's some six, seven of us and you see this, whatever it is, hour once a week. But I wanted to connect the dots a little bit, like why I love to host. Why would I say I lived all these places? What did, what did that mean? That there is a first husband, that's Hannah's father. You know, my relationship with Richard just I wanted to follow the breadcrumbs a bit because I think people kind of knew me a little bit, but didn't understand the bigger picture of it. And I'm hoping that people now kind of get it a little more. So we're talking to you. You are right now at Bluestone Manor, correct? Ta -da. Well, look at it's a, it's look at there's the back of the book and there's the painting. <laughs> I mean, I like it. <laughs> what is the appeal of it though? Like for people who aren't familiar with it, of the Berkshires, what, why do you love it so much? Me, why me. Would people I, love it? I'm from California. I don't understand it. So you tell, why, you know what? I'll tell you what I think it is. It's a funny thing. First of all, obviously being on the show, it's, it's had so many incredible moments, but it is a magical place. You know, listen, it's 119 years old. It was, it's, it's an old Stanford white house. It's definitely of a different era. I've sort of gone with that look. And even though it's renovated, it's really restored. It definitely has, it's a dense feeling of history. It's almost like a living thing. And I think just the whole show and everything have almost made it like an urban myth of it. You know, I've kind of become like Cinderella in the castle. Cause I know even a lot of times I'll do the zoom 
and people will come up and be like, oh my God, you're there. I'm like, well, yes, it's a real place. Like it's not a film <laughs> set. <laughs> like I actually live here and I'm very passionate about it. I mean, you know, I live here, I entertain here. I just feel like it really engages me. You know, everything I love to do is about the house and the family and Bluestone Manor and hosting and having people over and having people. It's a very English way of doing things. I mean, it's not at all. It's definitely more English countryside way of living, you know, dinner parties than it is sort of the Hamptons thing where you go out and stuff. So I think people just kind of fall in love with it. It's cozy. It's yeah, a cozy and I, and, place. And I, and I saw that you were doing this whole Airbnb thing where you're kind of like renting it out. That's and it's amazing. coming up in the next couple of days. Does that make you nervous at all to have people in this place that is your sanctuary? Well, I mean, it's not like I'm renting out. It's a, it's a night. It's, you know, it's a one night thing. I think people think I'm renting it for like a week. It's more of an experience. And obviously it's very curated and, you know, it's not like people are running rampant in my bedroom. So it's a very <laughs> curated thing. Not really, because, you no. know, I have people, listen, if I can have all those girls up here for four nights, I can certainly have someone here for 12 hours. <laughs> what it I mean, let's put it in perspective. So do you think, though, if this goes well, could you see yourself doing this more down the road? Because, I mean, the place is so famous and people want to see it that I could see this. I can get my head around this experience. You know, they, they come at four and leave the next day at 10. And it's sort of a, a, a curated thing that's got a lot of rules and regulations. Um, but I just, I think people will, I think they'll just love to see it. I think people have a mad love affair with Bluestone Manor. I'm going to tell you the truth. When I was put on pause, people were like, no more Bluestone Manor. And I was like, well, what about me? No, literally, there was an outcry because it was such a big part of the show. And so many things happened that I think, and then people miss Len. I kind of got lost in the whole mix of it. Um, because you know, it's almost like a living, breathing character. And I... I like pe a house is meant to be lived in. It's not a precious house. I know it may look like a precious house, but we use every room. We use all the china. It's a use. It's a user friendly house. I'm in my kitchen. I know I have a precious precious kitchen. You know what I mean. So, um, what's gonna happen? And I want people to walk away from it and kind of. I want to hear the stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. So. The thing with Airbnb, you can leave reviews. Have you left a negative review? Or has someone left a negative review? On Airbnb? Yeah. Well, not yet. This I've is going to be the first one. Airbnb. Oh, so they, they haven't done that yet. Well, <laughs> are you nervous about like what you someone would leave? I feel like if Dorinda's in the house, someone's going to leave like a gift for you. Like I could see someone like leaving vibrators out for you to just come in like, oh, and just like <laughs> leave you toys or shit like that. Let no, them leave that them. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm so I, I'm know, so the, fascinated the by this whole thing. Is they'll do like the main room and the and the sort of downstairs, but the upstairs is sort of yeah. You know, the house is sort of broken up into parts, so there's just certain parts that they'll be able to use. I mean, everybody wants to stay in the fish. But will room. you will you will you be there at that time to just kind of make sure everything no. goes smoothly? Oh, so you're out. You're like, nope. You do your thing. You know, it's not like Airbnb started this yesterday. They're very, you know. They've got you because I'll tell you the truth. When they first approached me, I couldn't kind of get my head around it. But you know, it is a it's sort of a it's two one night experiences. I'm going to be away just promoting the book like nonstop, mm -hmm. and it's not you know they know what they're doing and they they are very professional. So I don't know. I'm not worried about it at all. I really trust in them. We've worked on this a long time. You know, it's it's we kind of decided to you know make it a number that we're going to give obviously the Ronald McDonald House. So a lot of people could to could possibly come. I mean, I don't think they expected such a huge outcry. Even Airbnb, I don't really think got their head around it. Because unless you're sort of really engaged in the show and really engaged with the myth, you know, I don't think you know they really understand. The girl come, one of the women from it, Aubrey called me and said, "Oh my God, I mean, this is outrageous." I I, I said, "Yeah, welcome to welcome to Disneyland." <laughs> So, Dorinda, if you could do an Airbnb at anyone else's house, who would you rent out if the if the money was going to a good cause? But whose house would you want to stay a night at? At that's a housewife. That's a housewife. It doesn't have to be a housewife. Anyone. Um. Well, I think that I would probably stay if a non housewife. Of course, I would love to stay at Buckingham Palace. Ooh, that'd be a good one. I would love to spend the night at Buckingham Palace. And if it were a housewife, I'd like to stay probably at Lisa Vanderpump's. 
Okay. All right. It's, it's, uh, she, yeah, she's got a pretty cool place. She's got like the wild animals going on. Speaking of Buckingham Palace, were you friends with Princess Diana? I wasn't friends. I mean, that we got, I'd be, well, I knew her. You got to remember when I lived in London for nine years, everybody thought I looked like her. So people would always call me her doppelganger. And we both worked out at the Harbor Club. And Sophie, um, one of uh, some of the married, uh, Sophie who married uh, Prince, uh, uh, Edward, God, I can't even get her straight, uh, lived in Culhern Court and Bolton's near me. And it just was, you got to remember back then, London was very, was much smaller. And we didn't have phones and internet and Instagram. So we all kind of knew each other socially. And I was super lucky because my DCL character clicked in with a very interesting group of women, a lot of Lord and ladies. And it just kind of happened. It fell upon us. So she used to work at the Harbor Club. I used to see her at events I'd go to. She said to one day, oh, God, I finally met my doppelganger because people really in my younger years, I used to say I look like her. And then, yeah, one day she just bought my cashmere and then I saw her wearing it. And I was like, that's odd. And that was sort of my claim to fame. But it's not like I was hanging out and having lunch with her. I mean, would she say hello to me if she saw me? Absolutely. But I wasn't you know, exactly hanging out in bed with her, you know, <laughs> shooting the, the, the stories and gossip. That, that's amazing. Did, but the did sweetest you... person, the kindest person and very, um, she had like an, an innocence about her. So yeah. I want to know: do you, did you do you watch like The Crown or anything? Because what Are I'm always fascinated with, I live for all that stuff. You know, I, I want to know though how I accurate. Myself part British because after living there for almost ten years and raised, you know, I raised the big part of Hatton, Hatton's for seven years, and my husband was Scottish, and we lived there, and I lived there in a very young time of my life, a very formative time. So it was really kind of like a time where. I got married, I had a baby, and I wasn't coming back. If I had stayed married to Ralph, I would still be in, in England because there wasn't like this expat that was come over with Goldman Sachs and going back. That was my life, and I had to really, and it was also very after post, uh, it was post Thatcher, the beginning of John Major. So there were really no Americans. Now, you it's like any other city, but back then, you were an oddity to be. I remember this woman said to me, for God's sake, so what, another American in, in the Boltons. I was like, yeah, well, I'm just so sorry. I mean, yeah. So, so, no, so when you watch a show like that, do you feel like they do a pretty good job of like representing the characters and like what they were really like? I mean, because that. Well, I mean, I wasn't uh, hanging out with them. I don't know about the inner workings. But, you know, I think the thing that I loved about living there, and I, I took to it like a fish to water, I loved all that formality. I loved the whole, the way of life. I mean, I would have no problem moving back to London, and I could do it in two seconds. It would be as if I never left, because I was there in such important years. Um, and I still have a lot of friends. You know, London's like peeling an onion. England's like that. It takes a long time to get to it, but once you get to it, you're friends forever. It's as if... Some of the first people, when they heard about my book, I heard from all my friends in London and stuff. And even if they move all over the world, you still stay friends with them because it takes a while. You know, Americans tend to rev up quickly with each other and they have, it takes a while to get to that point when you live uh, uh, abroad. But I would, you know, there may be a time when I move back. I was just discussing that with Hannah. I could see myself moving back to London. When I go back, it's the weirdest thing. I'll, I used to go back a lot because it's, I, I never, I, my whole thing is I never went to the West Coast. I would, if I lived, you know, when I was back in New York, if I was going to spend that much time, I'd go back to, to England because it's about the same as going to LA. And if I stay more than four or five days, it's as if I lived there again. People are like, darling, would you like to come to the country house this week? And I'm like, yeah, I think I would. I'd like to go back <laughs> to that whole thing. Do they have a Real Housewives of London? Oh, I was about to say that. Yeah. That why would be it awesome. Been? Ladies of London. Okay. And one of my great friends, Caroline Stansbury, was in it. And I thought it was great. I think they should have kept it on. But, for, I, but I, you know, I think it was kind of a hard translate. People don't, if it, unless you lived in London, you, I don't know if Sally from Kansas really could relate to it. You know what I mean? Mm. I could relate to it. And I think a lot of people that live in New York and stuff, maybe. But it's a definitely different way of life. But it really is like that. It's a different way of life. Interesting. You, I've seen you on the streets of New York City, and you are very, very good to the fans. Like when people know you, you show them a good time. I've seen you sitting at dinner, and the table next to you knows you, and you go out of your way to kind of just have like a really cool moment for them to give those people a really cool experience. What, who's come up to you like over the years that it was just like, holy shit, this is awesome? Like a big star that was a fan of you or the Housewives franchise. 
You know, that's a good question. I mean, we've I've had so many different people come up to you and people that surprise you that are friends. I'm always surprised when like people that like I, it's it's not going to be anyone famous, but I was at Felix the other night, uh, the, you know, the babe, the sister of Bill Bouquet, which is like my favorite place to go. I just it, it I just love the whole feeling of it. And there was a very, very, very sort of Upper East Side pearl clad bun Chanel jacket woman. And I'm thinking, and she's looking at me and I'm thinking, oh, she must think, oh my God, what is that disgusting real choice of New York City media, right? Because I'm like, and she's like, I just love you. And I was like, <laughs> you, don't seem like you seem more like a metal club person. You know what I mean? So that you never want to, it's not so much who, like the person or what they're doing. It's always like, I think there's a little secret society of people that watch it that you would never think about it. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky because I have a really great fan base. Like I'm, they're always pretty nice to me and happy to see me. Boy, my whole thing with the whole fan thing is, is like, how can you not be happy if someone's so happy to see you? Because you can see it in their eyes. It takes so much courage for them to come up to you. And you're thinking, I'm always a little bit freaked out because they look at me and I look at them like, what, what, what's wrong? You know what I mean? And then they, it takes so much courage to come up and say something to you that how can you not be happy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. I, I want to rewind. I want to be – how did you end up on Real Housewives? Like let's go back to the beginning. Like how did – did you get a call? Did someone nominate you, get, you? Like how did I mean, that process go? Oh, my go? goodness. I mean could you expect anyone better that they could have <laughs> I'm highly insulted that you would even ask that question. <laughs> They broke the mold. <laughs> uh, so wait, yeah, how did it happen? Just, like, what did they do? That whole scenery. And, you know, and I think that's the reason why when I came on, it was kind of a little bit seamless because I'd been on in the background a lot of times. I knew all the girls. I lived the life. We were always talking about it. You know, Jill Zarn was sort of the first person to, I remember her talking about moms in New York, moms in New York. They're doing moms in New York. It was a big deal. And I just think it kind of, happened organically it, it, the timing wasn't right for me when they were first talking to women because hannah was little and she was a sacred heart and i was a single mom and it just wasn't yeah you know, everything's timing with that show and then when i married richard i was kind of slipping in and slipping out um in the background and ramona would always say you should come on and joe would say you should come on and luann you know and and then after richard passed when they asked me for the third time i just thought you know kind of suggested that i thought why not you know hannah's at college richard's gone I think I'm just going to do something for myself. And I got to tell you something. It was one of the best things I did. I wouldn't have my book today if it weren't for it. So I'm not one of these housewives that walk away from it. They, yeah, they can't leave. It creates a lot of great platforms. It exposes you to a lot of great opportunities. I mean, I can open up a warehouse with the free stuff that people send me. It's crazy. I don't <laughs> even want to go to my, to my mail anymore. If, if, if used correctly, I mean, I think it really is creates a nice platform for you. Yeah. But you gotta have a thick skin. I mean, you can't go into it and be hurt by people and be hurt that someone doesn't hate you because you aren't, you're not gonna make it. It's yeah. not a show that you go into to be you know, loved all the time. People are going to love you to death and people are going to hate you to death. And you have to just be able to roll with the punches. Did you have a relationship with the other girls beforehand? Yes. Like, did you guys know each other? Yeah. And who was like the one you were closest to? I knew their kids. So who was like the one you're closest to? Parties and bar mitzvahs and baptisms. I mean, yeah, we had like long relationships, and I think that kind of showed through too on the show. So, when so you how say much you get, does? Oh, sorry, Adam, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, but how much does their opinions decide on who's gonna be on the show? You know, because you know, I'm not just saying this, Adam, because I'm being that person. We don't really, you know, they don't. We don't really get involved in the process. People think that it's a funny thing. People have some like image that the housewives are fully engaged with all the production side and hanging out with Andy every day, but it really isn't. You know, you kind of get asked and you go and like, and a lot of times you wouldn't know until you started the show the next season. Yeah. But I yeah. think that's good. I'm one of the people that's afraid of, 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 you know, talking about my time on there because I kind of, as Lisa Renner would say, I kind of own it. You know, I don't have, yeah. and that's why when it was, when it was done, I don't know if you noticed, but I just never went on this rampage of talking about it or talking to people or I just, I don't, I don't have that kind of thing. You know, everything has a beginning, a middle and an end and people make decisions for a variety of reasons. 
and you can't take it personally. And you just listen, I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have done the Nutrisystem thing. I wouldn't be doing this Airbnb. I wouldn't be, look at, I came out with my own bourbon. This is beautiful. I've got to do this after, you know, I've come out with a can. There's just got to focus on the positive sides of all the opportunity. No, absolutely. And it is. No, absolutely. I mean, if I had five of me to do work every day, you could just, you know, some people are much better at it than I do. I just get tired and I'm too hands on. Like I, I if I have to learn anything about this whole process, I need to learn to like delegate better because I want to have my hands in everything. I can't even let someone like make a pasta without me getting involved in it. My hand will be like, do you want, I'm going to just make some pasta. I'm like, hold on, move aside. Just make sure you put some more of this. Wait a second. Just move out of here. Just let me do it. Like <laughs> I can't release control. Yeah. So listen, I've never written a book before. And I feel that it would be like exposing some, like some parts would probably be very hard to write. Was there a part in this book that did take a lot of courage to put out there or stuff that maybe you didn't need the world to know, but you said, Hey, I want my readers to know about this at the end of the day. Well, I'm a pretty transparent person. I think if people knew me, but they didn't know, I wanted people to know me better. Um, you know, I think it was kind of, I thought people were surprised that, I think people were kind of surprised that I definitely suffered from an eating disorder. I never really talked about it on the show. Um, but, you know, it, it was a part of my life. It was part of my growth. I had to, you know, work through that. And there was a lot of reasons why I went through it. And of course, I really, I really enjoyed, I, I really enjoyed going through the steps of having Hannah again. Not that I never not remembered how great it was, but to really walk through it and remember that moment. And remember that I was on my own because I was living in London. And back then, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of money and stuff. So my parents couldn't just fly out whenever I said I was in labor. So I really just had Ralph there. And to think about, that would be like, I thought about when I was writing it, like if Hannah, cause I'm in a different position and Hannah's in a different position, no matter where she was in the world, that I would drop everything and fly out, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't have that privilege. You know, I had to call my mom and say, on a phone, you know what I mean? Like this, because there was no cell phones yet. Say, I'm going to the hospital. I'll try to call you, you know, when I'm, and I'm so close to my mother that I can't imagine that must have been very hard for her. I asked her, she said, oh yeah, your father and I felt terrible and, and we were worried to death, right? And yeah. I think obviously the, the journey of walking Richard to, yes, to dying was, was, really t difficult. In fact, when I did the audio book, I just couldn't get through it. I literally was like, okay, I'm good. I'm going to start good. And I would just start talking about, it because it's a weird thing, you know, when, when you, when someone dies and then you sort of talk about it in the past tense, you sort of restore them in your mind and they're what you remember them at their best, right? You don't think about them in that terrible state they were in when you had to walk them, you know, back home to, wherever they go next. So walking through and remembering and sort of visualizing, Richard came back to me as that person. I was like, oh, I don't want to remember that for him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that was very difficult because I felt, I felt sad that he got to go, he had to go through it. I felt sad that we had to go through it. I felt very proud of the way he handled it. And I felt very proud of the way my family handled it, you know? <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> no, I, I mean, listen. This is this is real raw emotion. I think that's what yeah. people are going to get out of this book, and I think. You and know, my daughters, my stepdaughter, stepson, and my daughter—they were just so brave. You know, I just I forgot about that because it was such a, you know, when someone pat when someone's dying, it's all about them. Everything, everything. You can't even think. You know, you're not hungry, you're not tired, you're not sleepy. You even aren't even a good mother. You're just like, oh my god, that person, that person. Oh my god, so. To think about, you know, you're just thinking about the person, but then to write about it, to think about, there were so many moving parts in, in his journey, right? To to bring him back home and stuff. That I said to Hannah after, you know, thank you, because I, I clearly was not that attentive during that time. And, and I'm, and I'm sorry. And what, do, I'm assuming your daughter has read the book as yeah, she comes in and said- Yeah, Hannah helped me through every chapter because she's a huge academic. She's a big writer. She it comes very easily to her, and she really helps pull it out of me and say, "Don't." She kept saying to me, "Don't be afraid. Like share it. People love when you share, Mom. You know that's something they love about you. You know, if they don't like it, too bad. It's your journey. It's okay." And it was so good. So I would do it, and then she would sit and read it, and she would sort of really help me have peace with it and let it go because you know it's lonely writing. It's a lonely thing, and it's scary. 
right? Because I'm the one that said it, say it, forget it, write it, regret it. I mean, I said that and now I'm defying my own, my own preachings. Yeah. I mean, the, the book, make it nice. It's, uh, again, I, I, I strongly encourage the listeners to go check it out. It's available where all books are sold. Simon Schuster behind it. It's a major book publisher behind it. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. You know, there's a lot of life lessons in this book. As someone reads this book, you know, and they, and they reflect on this book, what's the one thing you want them to take away from reading this book? One lesson. Believe in yourself, you know, believe in yourself. Don't listen to the outside noise because you got to, it, you know, your intuition is everything. And I sometimes didn't follow my intuition. And as I've gotten older, like I'm, I've, I've really learned to listen to my intuition. If it doesn't taste good, look good, feel good, seem right, don't do it. And when I haven't followed my intuition, something just happened last week. I'm not going to get into it, but something <laughs> happened when I had said a couple of months ago, mm, I just don't feel right about it. Mm, I just don't like the way that feels. And my goodness, it didn't turn out right. Yeah. yeah. So follow your intuition and believe in yourself. I know that sounds so simple, but it's hard to believe in yourself. It is. There's a lot of noise out there. And self-doubt is a terrible thing. Yeah. And Dorinda. don't be afraid of making, you know, the fear of mistakes. Like if I could say to my younger self, uh, you know, be, be, don't be so fucking afraid. So what if you fail? It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Dorinda, I want to ask you, if I'm at a bar and I see you, I'm going to buy you a drink. What's your go-to drink? Well, now I've been drinking, I've been drinking a lot of my bourbon and soda because I love it with fresh vents, but everybody knows, come on, you know what my drink is. I have like uh, one of my favorite sayings, I, martinis, but... dirty martinis. They're like breasts, two are great, three are too many. Yay! <laughs> are a lot of people, but how do you deal with like fans at, you know, at a restaurant, they want to send you over a drink, you know, do you, do you accept it? Or I you drink them. Drink? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I deal with it. <laughs> but you ever get to a point like, fuck, I'm getting, I'm getting pretty hammered right now. Like it's like, yeah, well, I don't know. Listen, that was in the beginning. You know, I used to be much better at that. To tell you the truth, I, you know, listen, obviously it's been COVID and quarantine and stuff, but I'm much more careful about that because otherwise literally you will. I remember once I was at, um, I think it was Bill Bouquet again, and people kept sending me over martinis. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you're right. You get slashed now. I'm like, no, 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 no. That, that's great. Thank you so much. Just, you know, I try to not. And I tell the waiters, don't send over drinks because people will. Because yeah. it's a calling card. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I can see a that. calling card. You know, one thing I did want to ask you. So people that have actually got an advanced copy of your book that have read it, has there been anything that they've reached out to you and said, I was really surprised that about this moment or that you, you talked about this, something that I think there's going to be like, you're going to get a pretty big response from like the general public when everyone starts to get their hands on the book. It's funny. The response so far has been like, you know, they, people feel like they know me a little better. Like someone said to me the other day, I knew you, but now I feel like I really knew you, even though even people that are close to me, because I've been, it's an interesting thing that I learned about myself right in the book. Like whatever chapter I'm in in my life, I kind of am really there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big person to talk about what was, you know, I sort of like kind of live in the moment. So someone that was quite close to me said, I didn't really realize that you like lived, lived in London. I'm like, well, yeah, I told you I lived there for almost a decade. They said, yeah, but you didn't act like you really live, live there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's funny. Um, I think people get to know me. And I just think people, um, probably what I hope and what I was really proud of myself is like, I was a lot, I'm a lot stronger than I, I, I imagined I am like, I'm a pretty strong woman mm -hmm. and mother and wife and human and daughter. And, you know, like, I really feel good about that. I feel like I've sort of, you know, done the best I could. And like, I've, I've made a lot of people proud and, you know, obviously sometimes haven't done that great of a job, but I got through it, you know, it's all's good. Do you think you'd get married again? Hmm. You know, I never say never to anything. I would love to have a, I, I was just talking to someone about, oh, I was taking, talking to Garcelle about this the other day. She, we, I did her podcast. It would be great now that sort of uh, things of, after going through COVID and things, I wouldn't, it's so funny because the, the, 
I, you know, I look at Ralph, and Ralph was such a great husband. We're still very close, but I couldn't marry him again. Richard was so such an important part of my life, but I've evolved so much. Like I don't even know if Richard would recognize me so much anymore. Like I don't know. Ten years on, he's going to be past ten years. I'm such a different person than I was when Richard met me because I wanted to be that person, wife and mother and caretaker and. You have Mr. Medley take care of stuff, and I love that part of it. It was so great and so fun because I had a little, you know, young daughter, and I love taking care of kids and running homes. Like, who would Dorinda Medley meet now? Maybe what? Well, Maybe I a was crazy wonder, professor. I don't know. I always wonder how like celebrities then like start dating people. Like, I know it sounds silly, but like it's a real question because you got to think alternative motives and stuff like how would how do you meet guys out there you know what i'm saying like how does that happen you're asking me <laughs> someone said to me the other night what's your go to move at bed in bed i said sleep what's your go to move in bed <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good you're asking me <laughs> i mean i did join this dating site the league and I kind of like, it just, even last night, the person's like, we kind of did the back and forth, back and forth. Then they ask for your personal number. So then you do us, that's another step closer. And then last night he's like, well, if you're in the city next week, let's meet for a drink. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's a, so now we're getting too real here. Can we just keep the back and forth? <laughs> yeah. That is so funny. But I think also New York City, you're in the best city to date because it's kind of convenient. It doesn't take too much effort to like walk downstairs and get a drink or. Well, that's and it. So many... We're in a very pedestrian city, New York. And also too, I like people. So I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't really think, oh, it's so hard to meet people. It's so hard to meet men. I just think it's more organic, you know, and I have a lot of great friends and I go to a lot of different great things. I think ultimately if I were to guess, I think like I went to something last week and if I, my life weren't so crazy, I would have followed up. I think I'm going to end up at a dinner party. I go to a lot of dinner parties and one of my friends is going to introduce me to one of their friends. That's just who I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Dorinda, we, we play this game on here. It's called fan question roulette. All right. So our fans submit videos of them asking questions. The thing is they don't know who our guests are going to be. So oh. they just have to ask a question we play it, and you answered. Are you down to play it? Why not? Go ahead. All right, Pat, can you play the first video for us? Because Hi, my name is Shannon, and this is Three. And we are wondering, what would be your weapon of choice in a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> well, of course, Hellman's mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> if like we get it. some really random ass questions on here. All right. Uh, you know, I think we have one more. Pat, we have one more, Wait, right? Our question is, if you had the opportunity to rename peanut butter, you could call it anything else you wanted. You got to pick it. What would you call it? Sheesh. Oh, geez, that's a random <laughs> question, but I kind of like it. peanut butter, what would you call it? I would call it sticky mudge. <laughs> I like that, dude. I, I gotta. I think that could sell well. Dorinda, you might want to get into peanut butter after booze. Head to peanut butter. You got books, yeah. booze, a sticky much sandwich, sticky much sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so we do a quick speed round. We're just kind of random, quick questions. Just oh, wow. first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, you know. So we'll kind of get right into it. Dax, I'll start off. Best right. bar in New York City. Bellman Bar. Best restaurant in New York. Lagaloo. Restaurant in New York City that you will always run into a celebrity. Restaurant in New York City. Oh, probably Indochine. Okay. Interesting. If you weren't on the Real Housewives of New York, what city would you want to appear on? If I weren't in uh, New York, what city would I want to appear on? I think I'd be great in New Jersey. <laughs> okay. I can see that. I like it. Uh, what is the most expensive purse you own? My Birkins. All right. Best hidden gem in New York. Best hidden gem in New York is probably, huh? Seems I feel like I'm so far away from like that kind of thing. So we haven't gone out. The best hidden gem in New York City. God, you got me on this one. I would say, well, the best hidden gem for me in New York City is obviously uh, it's not hidden but i just think the most underrated gem is central park i think central park is the go-to for everything 
I just, it amazes me every time the seasons. It just amazes me that we can be in the city and in 15 minutes, I could walk for 10 minutes and like feel like I'm, I'm bird watching. If you go to the bird watching part of Central Park, there are real bird watchers like that do things like this to you. <laughs> like, I'm in, we're, we're in New York City. Like, you should be able to talk to me like that. We're not in like, you know what I mean? All right. Uh, Is it true? No, you're, you're 100% right. I'm a huge Central Park guy. I, and I, I the love tennis it. courts in New York City, if you ever want to laugh your head off, take an early Sunday morning and go to the tennis courts in New York City. The cast of characters that are there, these older men fighting with each other, playing tennis, and they've probably been doing it for 50 years, okay? It is like watching a, a, a movie, a Woody <laughs> Allen movie. I, I, I love it. Okay. Uh, the one food everyone loves but you can't get into. The one food that everyone loves but I can't get into. God, you guys, the one food that everyone loves, that, that's not me. I like all food. I will eat <laughs> anything and I will try anything. I really, I don't have food. Hey, listen, I didn't grow up rich enough to have food allergies and all that. My mother would be like, uh, I'll give you a food allergy. You won't eat in a couple of days. That's not how we You're not allowed to be gluten-free. I can't imagine if I said to my mother, I'm lactose intelligent. I would, she would, no, we, I don't. <laughs> all right, my last question. What is the one book everyone needs to go out and buy right now? Make it nice. And yeah. Download the Audible because it's my book. <laughs> yes, yes. During the congratulations with I the book. Very good at that quick rounds. I'm sorry about. No, that. no, no. Uh, I I love it. It's 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 hard to think on your feet like that of like, but you know, what is trying to think of something great. Gem in New York City now because a lot. Of the it's a great question. Have, 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 I've closed. All the old school places have closed. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something like that could be. Like the speakeasies. Remember all those great little mm -hmm. speakeasies? They're gone. It's just not the same. I mean, my thing, I used, I still love uh, like just McDougal Street, but it's not the same sort of McDougal Street anymore. You right? know, Washington Square Park was like my, I didn't need to go to a jazz club because Washington Square Park, there was just jazz. And now it's like a Travis Scott music video. So it's. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, if you do want to laugh, go to the bird watching I, take, I took my friend, uh, Wendy, there the other day. People are very serious. Like, they, they, they talk in that voice, and they have all the equipment and the jackets on. And, like, yeah. Like, you, I, I was thinking to myself, maybe I should take up bird watching. Like, wouldn't yeah. that be cool? But then you got to shush people. Do you really want to be a shusher? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dorinda. I'm like, they... Woody, hey, Woody. The lady looked at me. I was like, what are you doing? She's like, she looked at me like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, that. of course, I wanted to get my New York moment. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Dorinda, thank you so much for coming on the Hollywood Raw podcast. You've been great. It's, uh, it's good. Congratulations with the book. It's yeah. going to be, uh, I think it's going to do very, very well. Keep doing what you're doing. You're sending out good vibes, and, uh, and the people respond to it. Are, are well, respond thank to it amazing. Thank you for having me. That was a lot of fun. Oh, well, that was fun. I like that. She was good, dude. She was great, dude. She awesome. Was fun. Really, for really, I, you know, I, she, that's why people love her so much from Real Housewives because she's got a fantastic personality. She doesn't hold back. She's honest. You know, uh, I think this book will do well for her. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really, I like feel that like she, she's someone you want like want to hang out with. Like totally, I put her from our previous guest. I put her into like the Kelly Osbourne, Melissa Rivers type people that like I want to hang out with and bullshit with. You yeah. know. Um, yep. as a New Yorker, I'm always interested in like, Hey, where do you hang out? What's your favorite spot? So it's very, it hits a little bit closer to home for me. Um, but she's definitely interesting and I, I get the appeal of her, you know, she's in a good mood. She's got good spirit. She's got good energy. And I think her book's going to do very, very well. So it's, uh, it's great to have her on the podcast. Um, and she's got a lot of exciting things coming out. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, we could check out this podcast. We have a video portion of this podcast. It's on YouTube, which you um, can see her sitting inside of Bluestone Manor the whole time. So if Blue you want to watch her and do this interview, you can head on over to YouTube. Yes, and uh, also you got to check out the Hollywood Raw podcast. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, 
TikTok run at all. Make sure the TikTok's blowing up. It's doing really well. It's a really fun account to follow. And if uh, you feel you can... like you've missed an episode, head on to HollywoodRaw.com. We never really mentioned HollywoodRaw.com. I don't know why. I mean, we've there's a lot of resources and video and all kinds of really just cool shit up on HollywoodRaw.com. Um, so head there as well. And the best thing you do, yes, and the best thing you do to support this podcast, once again, is leave a review, five star only, say a few kind words, and uh, it really helps out with the algorithm, really helps us out. You can find me at, at Adam Glenn, G-L-Y-N. You can find Dax Holt at D-A-X-H-O-L-T. And we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thanks for watching Hollywood Raw. See that little thumbs up thing? Tap that, like it, leave a review, and subscribe to our channel.